Good afternoon, and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know. You can find the Commonwealth Club on the internet at commonwealthclub.org. I'm Evelyn Dilsaver, a member of the Commonwealth Club Board of Governors and your moderator for today's program. Today's program is part of the Future of Work series sponsored by Wells Fargo and Ernst & Young. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's special guest, Michael Rossi, Senior Business Advisor to California Governor Jerry Brown. Mike Rossi is a Senior Advisor for Jobs and Businesses. He was appointed by Governor Brown in August of 2011 to be the point of contact between California's business and the administration. The governor charged him with streamlining and invigorating the state's economic development infrastructure, a challenge he has taken on head first. He also advises the governor on regulatory, legislative, and executive actions needed to job, drive job growth. From 2005 to 2008, Mr. Rossi served as a senior member of the operations team and as an advisor to Cerberus Capital Management. And during that time, he served as chairman and Ch chief executive officer of Alzora Bank, which is a bank in Japan, taking it public in November of 2006, and as chairman of GMAC Residential Capital in 07 and 08. Previously, he retired as vice chair and chief risk officer of Bank of, America, Bank of America Corporation. And prior to that, he was the chief credit officer at B of A and held various executive positions all over the world. He's a former director of at least 17 corporate and nonprofit boards and remains a member of the advisory board of Shorenstein Properties and is a senior advisor to the San Francisco 49ers. Very eclectic uh, portfolio. He is also chair of the board of the court appointed special advocates of Monterey County and is in the board of the special, special Olympics Committee of Northern California and Claremont Graduate University. Wide interests. Finally, he is a very proud and fierce graduate of Cal Berkeley. <laughs> so I would like you to welcome Michael Rossi. I never used to need these, did I, Steve? <laughs> well, thank you for inviting me here today. My name is Mike Rossi, and I am the Senior Advisor to Governor Brown on Jobs and Business Development. Governor Brown appointed me last year to help bring together the state's disparate economic development functions. Since then, I've spent my time attacking some of state government's job-stifling problems. Today, I would like to discuss some of those efforts, as well as provide a general overview of the health of the California economy. As the governor said in his State of the State speech at the beginning of this year, California is still the land of dreams. It's the place where Apple, Intel, Hewlett Packard, Oracle, Qualcomm, Twitter, where do they get these names? Facebook and countless other creative companies all began. And that's not to say that there aren't a series of long-term companies that have been in the state, such as Disney, that are also creative and continue to be on the cutting edge. This year, we saw several positive signs that the California economy is returning to its pre-recession state and will again be able to nurture as many innovative companies as possible. Despite what California's detractors would have you believe, the Golden State is still the most dynamic economy in the world, and the numbers are starting to demonstrate that. Specifically, in the last year, California has added 279,000 new jobs, more than any other state in the nation. In fact, California has added 41,000 more jobs than the next closest state, Texas. California's unemployment rate is at its lowest point since August 2009. In the last 12 months, half of all jobs created in the U.S. were created in California. The last two months, I'm sorry. 
and we are adding jobs at a rate of 2%, which is significantly higher than the national average. So we are adding more jobs at a faster rate than the rest of the country. California has more high-tech jobs than any other state. With 931,000 people employed in this sector, the next closest states are Texas with 492,000 and New York with 312,000. Information technology jobs have returned to their pre-recession levels. Let me just reiterate that. They've returned to their pre-recession levels. California has the highest number of green jobs in the U.S., with over 318,000 Californians employed in high-paying green jobs, a workforce second only to high-tech. California's 2,324 biomedical companies employ 260,000 people. This, end, this industry accounts for $115 billion in revenues, which is more than 18 states' annual gross state product. 3.5 million California small businesses account for 99% of the state's employers and employ 52% of the workforce. This is terribly important because, as everyone knows, the major thrust for job creation is from small and middle-sized companies, and we have a wide diversity and a large number of them. We are the number one state for venture capital, receiving four times more venture capital than the national average. We are the number one state for agricultural revenues, with $34.8 billion in revenues representing 12.3% of the U.S. total. And California is the number one state for attracting foreign direct investment. That being said, California still has roughly two million unemployed people. But we now know that the two biggest job losses in California came from construction and finance related industries and from government. We'll re reiterate that as well, from government. After the mortgage bubble burst in 2007, California lost a million jobs in the construction industry and its financial partners in the under-regulated mortgage industry. In addition, California shed 116,000 government employees since the start of the recession more than any other state. Texas, meanwhile, added 76,000 government jobs, the most in the country. But in the last year, jobs in the construction industry grew by 5%, the highest in the nation which is an amazingly important point, because when you look at what drives growth in, in this state, construction is one of the major drivers. So it's really great that we can see some real growth in this area. So for me, the bottom line, California is starting to add significant numbers of new jobs in sustainable, high-paying sectors like business, professional business and professional services, transportation, healthcare, information technology, and international trade. And the Bay Area is leading the way. Just last week, there was a report that said the South Bay has the nation's, nation's strongest job growth. So it turns out we are not the job-killing machine that our competitors in other states would, like, would have you believe. And our economy is starting to come back. And it's not without cause. During this past year and a half, the governor has been steadily rolling out a long-term economic recovery plan that was ab about more than just flashy proposals. The governor's actions have sought to rebuild California's financial stability and foster a stronger economy for the long term. Governor Brown signed two consecutive on-time and balanced budgets for the first time in more than a decade. This year's budget protected funding for education and public safety while cutting $8 billion from government. It closed a $15.7 billion deficit and built a reserve of nearly $1 billion. The direct result of the governor's leadership was that the state's credit rating was upgraded from negative to positive in just over a year. What's in this amazing time frame given how slowly rating agencies work today. The governor was also, also established the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development, we call it GoBiz, which serves as the state's single point of contact for business owners. We are currently adding capacity to the office 
and they will take over several economic development programs to create one of the strongest state commerce offices in the entire country. California, once again, has a state economic development office for the first time in almost a decade, and our team there is focused solely on job creation and making California a better place to do business. As a result, we are starting to see more companies locating into California. I'm going to give you several examples. Dell opened a new research development center in Santa Clara that is going to create 700 high-paying jobs in the tech sector. German-based electronics manufacturer Zollner just invested $17 million in a new manufacturing facility in Milpitas that will create 300 new jobs. Massachusetts-based Blue Homes moved their headquarters to Vallejo and plan on hiring 160 people by the end of 2012 to build green modular homes. Sun Edison moved their headquarters from Maryland to the, to the peninsula after governor signed legislation that made it easier for them to sell low-cost units. Ford Motor Company is returning to the Bay Area for the first time since 1984. They're going to build a state-of-the-art innovation center in Palo Alto to scout new technologies and find new partners. And ACT just opened a new call center in Sacramento that will create 2,000 jobs in an area of high unemployment. And tomorrow in Torrance, the governor will be celebrating the increase of green jobs at Frito-Lay, where they've just added another 46 green trucks to their delivery system, to their delivery fleet. These are tangible results that were born from the hard work of the people in the governor's office getting up every day to make sure California is competitive. As, you, as we look ahead, California's economic future continues to look brighter, and here are some of the things you can expect to see. As I mentioned, we have realigned the following elements of economic development under GoBiz. The, the Infrastructure Bank, the Film Commission, the Travel and Tourism Commission, the Small Business Loan Guarantee Program, and the Small Business Development Centers. All are bring, bring, being brought under GoBiz and will have a stronger emphasis on job creation and promoting California as a place to do business. In addition, our team is looking at ways to streamline the permitting process for everything from small business owners to major solar projects. We will open a trade and investment office in China by the end of the year with our partners here in the Bay Area and around the state. We will continue to loc locate companies into California. And in the coming year, the state will conduct a complete review of all burdensome and du duplicative regulations. This is a lot of work, and there's still more to be done to make California as great as it can be. But the potential of the Golden State is limitless and our team is committed to making California the best state in the nation to do business. So with that, I'll look forward to your questions I'm not going to answer. <laughs> Great, Mike, thank you. So could you talk a little bit more about GoBiz and what you believe you've achieved so far? I know it's, it's hard to pull all of those organizations together. What have you achieved so far? And what are your challenges going forward? Well, GoBiz was, uh, is this working? Yeah. You may not want to hear this. Uh, GoBiz was finally put into statute in January of 2012. We got our budget uh, approved uh, late last month. We are in the process of hiring uh, staff, so we're building the, the best team we possibly can. Uh, we're going to double the number of business assistants so that we can continue to assist companies uh, at work their way through the regulatory issues that exist in the state, find out what grants are available, find out what benefits are available on a tax basis. Uh, and we are going to integrate over the next several months, as I said, the infrastructure bank the Small Business Operations, the uh, Tourism Commission, the Film Commission, in order to get all of those disparate economic activities in one place. So I would say that we have a lot of organizational work that we're working through, but last year, 
the precursor of GoBiz, touched 3,500 companies and helped them with a series of things that allowed them to either invest more in California, move a company to California, move an office to California, all from the perspective of developing jobs in California. You talked a little bit about redundancies when you said that was something that you were trying to do. What redundancies are you trying to eliminate? And what have you found, I guess, is the question. Well, in Great Britain, redundancies are getting rid of people and I'm trying to get out of this job, no. <laughs> Um, I was talking about duplication. Uh, SB 617 was passed by the legislature, and it, it requires that all agencies, with the assistance of the Department of Finance, uh, the Office of Administrative Law, uh, review all regulations for regulations which are overly burdensome or duplicative. And that process is starting as we speak. I'm pushing to get that done as quickly as possible so that we can simplify as much as possible the efforts that companies need to make in order to establish a business or grow a business in California. Okay, I have a question that uh, several people have asked. Uh, what are the prospects for high-speed rail to Tahoe? <laughs> or at least minimally decent rail to Tahoe. <laughs> uh, we um, got our vote in July. I spent probably from November to July on average six, seven hours a day on high-speed rail, and I just shut it off once the vote was done. So I, 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 I have to readjust. But I don't think you'll be seeing high-speed rail anytime to Tahoe. Uh, and other rail facilities are not something I oversee. Okay, great. And so what have you found are the challenges in improving the business growth amongst the charged political environment that we have here in California? Would you like to ask me that again? What are the challenges you have found in improving business growth amongst a charged political environment? I don't think the charge political environment is, 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 is not an issue for me. I think that the challenges for, for, for growing businesses, strangely enough, are fairly straightforward. We do have to do something about regulations. We do have to make it easier to negotiate the, the, the regulatory burdens that exist in this state. We do need to do everything we can to ensure that people understand the various things that can be offered to them as part of the, the state's efforts to, to support business growth. Uh, and we have to be better about telling our story. The thing that strikes me as the most egregious is that people who say they have a stake in California's success continue to say things that are patently untrue. One of those is that we have this large unemployment number, and it's the result of us not being competitive in a mass exodus from the state of businesses. This is something that is primarily perpetrated by a gentleman in Orange County who states the number is 254 companies left the state last year. And number one, we have to realize that this gentleman makes his living relocating companies. <laughs> Secondly, there is no data anywhere where you can find numbers of companies that have either entered or left this state. It's just not kept. So I would suggest you we look at a couple of numbers. I'm a, I'm a banker. I love numbers as some of my colleagues out there will tell you. And, and here are the numbers, I think, that tell the story. We have two million unemployed people in this state, approximately. It's a large number, and I don't, miss, I don't mean to minimize it. But from, a, from an explanation point of view, we now know, as I said, that a million of these jobs were lost in construction and in the related financial industries as a result of the mortgage bubble. 
So if there was a large exodus of jobs as a result of competition or just people leaving the state, I'm not sure where they are because half of our job losses didn't go anywhere. People didn't exit the state for that million. They, the job market just collapsed because the mortgage market collapsed. Now the other million, let's assume that a part of that is a result of the multiplier effect of the jobs lost in the construction and financial industry. So you've now gone from five to somewhere in our neighborhood of three and a half percent. Three and a half percent unemployment compared to everywhere else in this country is pretty good except, except North Dakota. So there is no justification for the statement that there is this mass exodus from the state of California that it's the result of all of this, the ability of other states to take our companies because we know exactly where the unemployment numbers came from and that isn't where they came from. So I think that when I look at this wonderful advertising for New York and how they've changed their, they've got Bobby De Niro saying how wonderful they are, I venture to guess that the regulatory burdens, and, and, and if one wants to talk about union issues, all of those things that people like to talk about are far greater than the state of California, but they're selling their state, and we're not. Let's turn to the job prospects, and especially for college grads. So amidst a rising tuition costs and underemployment across the strait, what is the state, what is the economic outlook for upcoming and recent college graduates over the next several years? And another way to put that question is, where is the job growth for our college graduates? Well, if you look at the state, as I just said, we created in the last 12 months 279,000 jobs, 279,900. And they were all primarily in, play, in jobs that would come under the heading of high paying jobs in the area of uh, business and professional services, healthcare, uh, trade and transportation, information services, uh, and uh, education. So those jobs, there's a growing demand. We have, in fact, by a late, uh, uh, a most recent uh, study showing that there are more job vacancies in this state than have existed in many years, and it's the issue of like, making the match, but clearly you are beginning to see those, the, the economy come back in that arena. And are we teaching our students for the right jobs going forward? You know, I'm a great believer, and so you know, you're talking to a very old person here. I'm 68 years old, and I believe that the best education is a, is a humanities education. I, I just believe that. And, and so I think that we are, I think students are making the best decisions that they can for themselves in deciding what they want to study. I would study humanities, which is what I did study. Never, never took a business course. So I would tell you that uh, some of my colleagues out there would say it's pretty clear I never took a business course. But, uh, but I, I, I would tell you that when you look at the state of California and you look at higher education, you, know, you look at, 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 at uh, university education and you look at the University of California at Berkeley, dare I say, Stanford, Santa Clara, all of the other University of California campuses, Loyola, we have a large and important educational system in this state that companies love because it, we have such great educational facilities, even with the burdens we have today of, of not having the same tax dollars we had in, in the recent past. So a big question then is if Prop 30 fails, what is your view of how we're going to fund the uh, state upper education? Look, if, if it fails, it's already, in, it's already there in the budget. It's not a matter of my view. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. So it better not fail. Do you know of any public-private partnerships that are being encouraged to help fund uh, higher education or even the K through 12? 
No, I'm not aware of any. Okay, great. Now let's move to international expansion. But by the way, that's not my area, so that doesn't mean there aren't any. I'm just not aware of any. Yeah, well, I knew you weren't going to answer one if you didn't want to. <laughs> so uh, international expansion. So with a high, you, you mentioned earlier that we're encouraging do, in, uh, international dollars to invest in California, and it's the number one state for attracting foreign investments. What are we doing to attract companies, international companies, to invest in California? Look, I think that, you, that there are a couple of things we have to talk, talk about if you want to talk about that issue. The best way to attract any international company to California is to have the best economy we can have. It, we are a huge market. We are either the eighth or ninth, ninth largest economy in the world. Everyone wants to sell into this market. The question is, can we, make, can, can we create an environment where they want to also build and invest in this marketplace? So what the governor has, has directed me to do is to reestablish our international network, which we haven't had for over, I think since his last time as governor, which is, you know, I don't, I don't even know if I can count that far back. But uh, to reestablish our trade reps starting in China because of the close relationship we have with China. And as a, as a result of that desire, we, we went down and he met with the uh, Vice President of China, soon to be the President, Xi Jinping, uh, to open up relations that would lead to a series of relationships with provinces and the central government of China. We've signed a series of MOUs with Jiangsu province and uh, have a t task force for the development of interlocking trade agreements and investments. And we just need to continue to work at that every day in every way. Uh, and clearly, it is high on his agenda, and we intend to open up our first trade and investment office by the end of this year. That's wonderful. It, related to that, a question came through on the audience of how many jobs in California should be filled by foreign workers, and is there such a thing as a, a balance of foreign workers to American workers? I have no comment on that because I have no idea how to answer that question. Okay. Okay. Uh, tax reform. What are the prospects for a tax reform so that California workers are not at a disadvantage compared to other states? And I don't know that they necessarily are, but in this particular question, uh, the questioner feels that we are. So could you talk about tax reform and specifically tax policies that burden imported goods and services with taxes? No. Okay. <laughs> Any thoughts on workforce training needs in California? I think they're immense. And, the, uh, and I have to be very careful here because I think I've just become the chairman of the workforce board. Um, I think that's what the governor told me yesterday as I was trying he to get out He keeps assigning you new projects every day. Yes, well. <laughs> uh, the, um, I think that we clearly need to be constantly reviewing whether or not we're doing that. You know, the, the issue of whether, the, the previ a previous question about whether or not we are training our young people for the right jobs. As I said, students make their decisions of what they want to do and what they, what they should study. In retraining a workforce, you constantly have to be sure that you aren't training for last year's jobs. So, it, I mean, it's, it's absolutely right. And I think that is something that, that is just purely a matter of being tenacious and staying on top of, 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 of the exercise. So I believe we are, and I will come back and give you a better answer once I'm sure. Right. So as part of the, as chair of the workforce training, um, what are the prospects for high school grads, those don't, that don't have a college degree? Are there gonna be jobs for them in the state of California? Absolutely. And where would those be? do you believe? Well, if I got up and pulled the curtain aside and looked out the window, they'd be right there. <laughs> I mean, there are jobs for non-college graduates all over this state. I mean, there are more non-college graduates employed in this state than college graduates. 
So I, yes, the answer is yes. Okay. Great. Could you talk a little bit about the Affordable Health Care Act, if, you, if you're willing to talk about that? I'd be willing to talk about it, but okay. anything I told you wouldn't be of any value because I'm not terribly up to date on that act. So. I'll well, the, the, the tax that's going to be applied to the businesses, do you think that will affect the job growth in California? No. I don't believe that. It doesn't mean I'm right, but I don't believe that that will affect job growth. What's going to affect job growth is if there is a demand for products. And if we, are, if we create the right environment so it's easier to develop your products, people will sell into this market and they will manufacture in this market. Okay. And by the way, there's no indication historically that I know of that that would be the case either. Let me uh, change um, the form of the question a little bit. Uh, tourism. So the Tourism Bureau is under you, also under GoBiz. So what steps are you taking to increase and improve tourism in California? I'm going to tell you, I'm not taking any steps. Um, the lady who runs the Tourism Board, Carolyn Bedetta, does a marvelous job. Uh, I don't think anyone runs a better Tourism Board than she does. So I have a great belief that has worked for me in my entire career. When people are doing the best job in the world, I don't mess around with it. What I would like her to do as we bring, as we bring these groups together, and I have already done it in one instance, is use her and her skills and her people's skills to help sell the job side of California. And she was uh, one of the people who will, she is one of the people who will help us in continuing to develop our uh, international involvement. Uh, part of our um, businesses in California is agri agriculture industry. What do you think is the outlook for the agriculture industry for the next several years? I think it's excellent. I mean, we are on the cutting edge of developments in that arena. We are have critical mass, certainly. And so I think that it will be excellent. Okay. Uh, this one question says, I hear complaints about needing to reduce the regulatory burden. When you say regulatory burden, what areas of business are you addressing? What areas of business am I? I'm not addressing the areas of business. I'm addressing the state. The regulatory burdens are how long it takes to get just chartered to run a business, how long it takes to get certain things approved to build a plant, how long it, it, it takes to, to expand a, a, a restaurant. There are a series of regulatory requirements that are burdensome and could be streamlined. Does that extend down into the city levels or this is only yes. the state level? No, I, ah. I think that if you're going to really make it work, it can't just be the state level. It has to be the city and the county level as well. And how are you approaching that? Carefully. <laughs> okay. Is there is there a, individuals assigned to working with you? Yes. On well, that it's, it, well, it's GoBiz. GoBiz is responsible for that. They're in the process of, uh, as we as we speak. Well, not as we speak, but it will be again tomorrow morning, dealing on. Uh, we're, we're, putting together a program to work through a series of these regulatory issues to see how we can simplify them and get people to work with us to do that. If there's one regulatory burden on business, what do you think that number one issue is and how are you solving it? I th look, the interesting thing is when you talk to businesses across this state, north, south, east, west, there is no one operation, one, one regulatory thing they talk about. They just talk about the burden in general. Mm -hmm. And I think we just have to work on it in that basis. So along those lines, if you are, how, how do you prioritize it then, I guess is the question. When you have so many issues to work on and you have just the right number of, of staff to work on, how do you prioritize which ones to work on? 
Well, you prioritize it the way you do in a business. You sit down, you decide what you think you need to get done, or you, know, you decide what you need to get done, you decide which ones you want to get done first, and you prioritize it. And you need to not allow the old economic principle of the Italian economist Prieto dictate the wrong decisions. You want to deal with the 20% that cause 80% of the problem, not the 80% that cause 20% of the problem. Okay, Romney compared the economic state of California to that of Greece today. But how does California stand relative to other states across the country? I know you answered some of it in your um, prepared talks, but could you expand on that? On which part? <laughs> well? I mean, with all due respect to Governor Romney, who I've known a long time as a result of his time at Bain Capital, the thought process that anyone could compare California to Greece <laughs> is so beyond the pale that it's not worthy to comment upon. So let's move on to the next question. That's great. All right, you don't take a salary for your service. You agreed to work for the governor because you saw an opportunity to make a difference and the governor felt you were the right man for the job. What have you been most surprised by since entering the public sector? Well, first, I don't know if the governor ever said I was the right person for the uh, job. I think as a, an attorney, he has said on numerous occasions, the jury is still out. But I would tell you a couple of things have struck me as and by the way, the fact that they have struck me as, as unbelievably interesting probably says more about me than, than what I'm about to tell you. In my career, I have spent most of my time fixing other people's problems. That was sort of my job. And people who have worked with me would tell you that I work unbelievably long hours and I'm very demanding. I will tell you that I have not worked with any group of people who work harder, who work longer hours, and certainly in an economic sense for less than the people in the governor's office. It is amazing how much time and effort these people put in. And I'm extremely proud that they let me work with them. The second thing is that I thoroughly enjoy dealing with the governor because he also is a humanities individual and reads everything. And we probably have some of the best conversations I've ever had in my life. Probably don't result in much, but they are great conversations. <laughs> You're listening to the Commonwealth Club of California radio program, and our guest today is Michael Rossi senior business advisor to Governor Jerry Brown, who's discussing the outlook for jobs and the economy in California. Now, the governor killed the redevelopment um, housing, redevelopment uh, agencies in local areas, and a lot of jobs uh, were lost as a result of that. Any chance that redevelopment will be brought back? Well, let me just clarify a couple of things. I don't know how you define a lot of jobs, but a lot of jobs, in my definition, were not lost. The problem with the redevelopment agencies where they were badly run, for the most part, they, were, they created structural problems in, in, in an economic sense, and they needed to be overhauled, and you can't overhaul them in, as, as they were in existence. So uh, I don't have any problems with that decision. I would tell you that I'm not sure what we would do to replace them at this stage, but certainly I have been working with a group of people out of LA who have some really excellent ideas. I just haven't been able to get through them. All right. You said you were working with uh, Governor Brown. Do you work with um, Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom, who also has made growing jobs in California a priority of his term in office? And what is that relationship like? <laughs> Actually, um, I'm an advisor to the 49ers, and I told the lieutenant governor when we're playing the New York Giants, he ought not to rate, wear a blue baseball cap at the game. <laughs> uh, look, the lieutenant governor, I think, has done some 
real heavy lifting in trying to figure out what, what we ought to do in this state to uh, incent businesses to grow. Uh, and I work with him in his office uh, as the opportunities present themselves. Uh, the new China Trade Office that you mentioned, is that going to be different from the one that we had before in 2003? I don't and know because I wasn't here. Okay. <laughs> so, so I have what, no idea what so it was what are the, in 2003. what are the challenges with setting that up and, and getting the Chinese to work with us? I don't think there are any problems with getting the Chinese to work with us. The problems with getting it set up are purely the ones you would have even in the private sector. You've got to go through the process. You've got to get the proper approvals internally. You've got to be sure that you've got the proper approvals from the point of view of opening the office in China. Uh, I, don't, I don't anticipate any problems that are insolvable. Okay. I have a, a couple of personal questions for you. What are your top three recommendations to Governor Brown? <laughs> I will tell you. Uh, that I don't talk about my conversations with Governor Brown. Okay. So then the next one is, when you're done with Governor Brown, um, <laughs> what, well, what position do you think you'll try to take next? I'm not taking any position next. My wife has made it very clear <laughs> what my next position will be. And it has nothing to do with anything other than what she says. Good answer. <laughs> uh, you, um, I, I'm always interested in the personal journey. So could you talk a little bit about your personal journey and why you decided you wanted to serve the state of California in the position that you're in? My paternal grandfather is a Miwok Indian and a hot carrier. Maternal, maternal grandmother was a Hawaiian lady from Waimea on the Big Island. My maternal grandparents, or my paternal grandparents, were immigrants from Genoa. My grandfather was a wagon wheel maker and a garbage man. My father was a garbage man. My mother was a nurse. She always maintained she was the best educated, even after I graduated from Cal. Um, and so in two generations, I got a college education. I got extremely lucky working for a California company, which was started by an Italian, Bank of America. I did reasonably well in that career and several others after that one. My kids went to the University of California. They both work here in this state. One has his own venture capital fund. He'd like to call it private equity, but I think it's venture capital. Uh, and my eldest son is a vice president of finance at Safeway. My grandchildren, I'm sure, will go to, to school in this state, probably live in this state. This state has been amazingly good to my family in all the generations they've been here. My father had a very simple tenant, that when you did well, you gave back. And writing checks was not the answer. Although we, I have a foundation that does that. And so when I was given the opportunity to participate in trying to help the state in one of the worst times in its history, I was happy to do that. And I hope that I will, I have, and will continue to contribute something of value in that exercise because I still believe that California, which is, by the way, why it irritates me so much that people are negative about the state with bad information, but I still believe that what Humphrey Bogart said to Ward Bond at the end of the Maltese Falcon. California is still the stuff that dreams are made of. Now for those in the audience that are in the social innovation space, uh, how do they work with GoBiz? Entrepreneurs? Um, real easy. Just pick up the phone, call GoBiz, and they'll be there. And I, I don't mean that facetiously. That's how easy it is. 
pick up the phone, call GoBiz. The lady in charge of GoBiz at this stage, and I don't mean she's changing, she's just taking it over. Uh, Panaria Advis is available, her staff is available. You can contact us on the net. Just make the effort and you will get a response. Uh, another question, how are you doing in re-employing veterans coming home from Iraq and Afghanistan? Not as well as we should, and we're working very hard to eradicate that. Uh, and it is something that's a, a priority to the governor and certainly a priority to me. And so we're doing everything we can, and we've made a, a special effort to do that in the case of high-speed rail. Now, I know you said you don't talk about the things you talk about with the governor, but could you talk about your working relationship with him? You started out with, uh, what, two days a week going to, to Sacramento, and now it's up to four days a week that you're up there. So could you talk about your relationship with the governor and how you work with him? Sure. Uh, that, I'm happy to talk about that. I mean, the, the governor is a Jesuit by training. And anyone who's been around a Jesuit-trained mind, you know that it isn't lineal. It is very Catholic and universal. And so in working with the governor, you need to understand that when he's asking you questions that don't always seem to be on point, if you're not careful, you're gonna be in trouble because they're all on point. He's just taking you to your destination a different way than you might normally go. So it requires you to be much better read, much better uh, understanding of the various issues that are in front of you. Uh, it's a very challenging and edifying interchange. I love working with the governor, and, and uh, he has the same sort of strange work habits I have. He'll call for an early meeting at 11 o'clock at night. Um, he'll call, and one of the good things I think about the governor, and it has been true of all the good bosses that I've had, is that they'll listen to you, but they'll have a vast reservoir of people, friends, colleagues, that they will pick up the phone and check everything you said. And I venture to guess some of the people in this room would tell you that's what I do. Uh, so I, I, I haven't been challenged by anyone other than maybe Dick Rosenberg and Luke Coleman uh, as much as I have been by the governor. And Dick Rosenberg and Luke Coleman, of course, Dick Rosenberg is the ex-CEO of B of A, and right. Lou is a vice chairman, and is now chairman of Grom and Aviation. So he believes in the, uh, uh, what is that quote, in God I trust all others bring data, right? I don't know if he does the first part, but he certainly does the second part. I, 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 I don't ask about that part. I assume so, but I'm, uh, that's, <laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> Now, you've had a lot of experience in the financial industry uh, in all the various roles you've played as chairman and CEO and as credit risk officer for B of A. Based on your experience, how has the financial industry changed over the last several years? <laughs> well, look, this is, I haven't been in the financial industry in a very long time. So any opinion I have on it would not really be germane. I would tell you, however, that the, what happened with the mortgage crisis is something that you have to be very careful about where you apply responsibility. We talk in this country about the financial industry as if it was monolithic. It isn't. There are commercial banks. There are investment banks, there are community banks, there are urban banks, there are rural banks. And so you have to be very careful when you're talking about the financial community. But I would tell you the one thing that maybe causes me some concern is the fact that as we have moved down this time compendium, we, people have become more and more comfortable with models and maybe ask less and less questions about character. Just an observation. And do you believe in the uh, too big to fail theory? 
for banks. Do I believe that banks can be too big to fail? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I mean, it, I mean, it's pretty clear that if you can get it to a sufficient size, that it, that, that if you don't unwind the organization properly, if it's having a problem, that it could have a major impact on the entire financial community that is then going to impact people who live in small towns who have never heard of the London interbank rate, it's a problem. Right, right. Uh, question about a book. Have you read Unintended Consequences? I thought I wrote that. You thought you wrote it? Good, good. I've read it more times than I care to imagine, and I've lived it more times than I care to imagine. And can you talk about that a little bit more? The issue of unintended consequences? Yes. Well, I've lived it mostly from fixing other people's unintended consequences. The issue of mortgage loans. Uh, I was chairman of uh, GMAC ResCap trying to fix that. The unintended consequences of lending to Latin American sovereign risk. I was involved in trying to fix that. The unintended consequences of assuming that you can tell what the risk profile and potential loss profile is of a series of debts of which you have no data on other than you've run a model saying it's going to be X, Y, and Z because of history. So I, I've I've seen a whole lot of unintended consequences in my life, and I'm very, very cautious about making decisions without thinking about those potential unintended consequences. Great, thanks. Um, going back to international trade, where do you see the most significant opportunities for companies who want to do business with us in California? Where do I see the most significant opportunities? Well, I would tell you that obviously we opened in China because we think that it being the economy that it is and the trade that it does, that that's a tremendous place for us to have uh, an office. But you would also have to think that Latin America, Mexico is a, a, a trading partner of size. Canada is a trading partner of size. Uh, I think those would be the areas that I'd be looking at as we sit here today. Right. Uh, we have time for one more question, and the question that I want to ask is about uh, how long do you think you really want to stay in this role, and what legacy do you want to leave behind when you do leave? I don't think about legacies, so I mean, I don't know. Legacies are for other people to decide. History decides what someone else's, like some, someone's legacy is. Uh, as to how long I'm in this job, I serve at the pleasure of the governor. So you have to ask him. Great, thanks. Our thanks to Michael Rossi, Senior Business Advisor to California Governor Jerry Brown. We also thank our audiences here and on radio, television, and the internet. Today's program has been part of the Future of Work series, sponsored by Wells Fargo and Ernst & Young. I'm Evelyn Del Saver, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. Thank you very much.